This is Thursday, August 23rd, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Father Joseph J. Golick, Jr. Welcome, Father Joe. Thank you. May it's I pleasure ask, to be here. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. May I ask when you were born? I was born August 16th, 1948. And where were you born? In Carbondale, Pennsylvania. And where is Carbondale? Carbondale is near the Poconos, near Scranton, Wilkes-Barre. And what town do you live in now? I live in Southboro, Mass. Marital status? I'm happily married. Do you have children? I have a son who's 40 years old, mm -hmm. and my daughter is 37, and I have three beautiful granddaughters. Congratulations. Thank you. And tell us what uh, Carbondale, Pennsylvania was like growing up. It was a small community. Everybody knew everybody. You did things for people. It was, it was very uh, family-oriented. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a great time. And did you have family serving in the military? Yes, my father had all his brothers serve in the military, and one was killed in action, mm -hmm. and my mother, my mother's brothers also served, and one was killed in action. Okay. Was that World War II, Vietnam? It's World War II. Okay. Where and when did you enter the military? One day I was riding by an armory, mm -hmm. National Guard armory, and I just popped in, talked to the recruiter, about becoming a chaplain and so he was the first person who I contacted and then from then on I did the paperwork and, mm -hmm. and joined. So that was in January 1986, I believe it was the 29th of January mm -hmm. where all of my physical and paperwork w was approved mm -hmm. and uh, I was commissioned a chaplain first lieutenant. And you are already serving as a priest? Yes, 17 and a half years. And where were you serving uh, as a priest? Uh, a ch Russian church in Nanico, Pennsylvania. And what was that like? That was very educational for me because I learned a lot. Not only did I serve the church, but I did other things. I, I volunteered at the hospital. I was on the ambulance. Mm -hmm. uh, I did things that prepared me to be able to do, enhance my ministry mm -hmm. as a chaplain in the military. And why did you want to uh, join the military? I always wanted to serve the military. My family, my uncles did, and, and mm -hmm. both sides of my mom and dad's side, and I just wanted to do it. Okay. Now, you were telling me before the interview that a uh, chaplain is a unique person in the military. Uh, for one thing, you didn't necessarily go to basic first, but you had a course. Tell us about that. What happened was, uh, I joined in the National Guard, and the National Guard is a little different than the active component in the sense of you join and then you have deferred schooling, mm -hmm. so you pick a time when you go to school. And I deferred to the following summer, and I went to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey for what, we, what the chaplains call a basic course. And I spent a month uh, at the basic course five weeks which are unnecessary, they have to be in residence. The other, court, the other uh, weeks you don't have to be in residence. Mm -hmm. So I took the five weeks in residence and uh, basically they teach you about military, military things, about how to, how to carry yourself, uh, a little bit of history about military, how it's organized, what it does, where you fit in as a chaplain, mm -hmm. what you need to do, and then they also teach you counseling techniques and how to help soldiers and families in need. And you also had some field duty? Yes, part of, part of the training is you, you take a week and you go to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and you go out in the field and you learn how to be a, a staff officer and how staff officers interact mm -hmm. uh, with the chaplain and you interact with them. And as a chaplain, you're a non-combatant. Correct. All chaplains are non-combatants. We don't carry weapons. Each chaplain is assigned a chaplain assistant, and that chaplain assistant carries the weapon. And everywhere the chaplain goes, the, the assistant goes with him, mm -hmm. uh, and he protects him. So you, um, after the schooling, are you still with the Pennsylvania National Guard? Yes, I came back to the unit, and I stayed with the, with the unit. 
and then uh, I applied for active duty. This was around 1987? Correct. Okay. And what was your first duty station? My first duty station was Fort Carson, Colorado. Now, were you ever out of Pennsylvania before then? Other than to go to the shore? Yeah. Or possibly go on vacation somewhere else, mm -hmm. but that was it. So that, that uh, I was 39 years old. Mm -hmm. My wife tends to think it was my midlife, midlife crisis move. <laughs> and our children, my son was almost 16 and my daughter was younger and they didn't know any other home because I was in that church the whole time they were, they were with me. Mm -hmm. And we packed up our things and headed west. And tell us what Fort Carson was like. Fort Carson was beautiful. Mm -hmm. If I could have stayed there for my whole military career, I would have. It was, it was just gorgeous. Um, it was exciting. I learned a lot. And I think my son, who joined the Marine Corps, uh, when we were getting ready to move from Fort Carson to my next assignment uh, went because of maybe I'm hoping because of me I asked him why he joined the Marine Corps and he said because I was too much I had too much discipline on him so I said so you joined the Marine Corps he said yes so. hope he went through it okay yes he did he served six years in the Marine Corps and mm -hmm. um, he's now a policeman in LA okay and how long were you at Fort Carson about three years I moved uh, to my next assignment in June of, of 1990, where I went uh, to Hanau, Germany. And where is Hanau? It's near Frankfurt. And what did you do there? I was assigned to a maintenance battalion, mm -hmm. and uh, we fixed all the things that broke in the military. Now, assigned. while you were in Germany, the first person to go to war was, I mean, you had a front row seat, didn't you? When I went in June, it just started mm -hmm. to happen. And uh, eventually all the, all the soldiers, all the units, with the exception of a few, were tasked to go to the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. So most of the troops that were in Germany left to go to the first Gulf War because it was closer than having, having uh, equipment fly from the states. So all the equipment and all this, most of the units went downrange. Mm -hmm. There was some talk of maybe I would go, but I ended up staying back with my unit because my unit was the maintenance unit, which the mission changed from being a maintenance unit to supporting um, incoming soldiers mm -hmm. uh, at midpoint and sending them downrange to the Gulf. Tell us what a typical day for you was like when you were stationed in Germany. In Germany, just like in every other assignment, the chaplain is unique in the sense that there are only three other um, occupations that have the same military as they do the civilian. For example, the JAG, the lawyer, mm -hmm. the doctors, and the chaplain. The chaplain is a chaplain. This is MOS specialty, which is military occupational specialty. Mm -hmm. And then he's a, a staff officer for the commander in religious affairs. So every morning, I would get up at five o'clock. Six o'clock, I would go to physical training with the officers and the men. And then uh, afterwards, you take a shower, grab some breakfast, you go have a quick meeting with the commander. Then you go visit your soldiers, wherever they are, whether in a motor pool or on a p particular mission. and. Uh, Council set up appointments. Mm -hmm. Do that during the day. Go to meetings if there are any special meetings, and uh, then you would go home. Mm -hmm. Did you feel there was any difference between counseling soldiers in peacetime and in wartime? Yes. Could you wartime, have... wartime, mm -hmm. you have more stressful situations. An example: when when I was in Germany, I got a phone call at two o'clock in the morning from one of my officers that, that the um, war is on and that you need to come in and check your vehicle. So I got dressed, went down, walked around my vehicle, put the key in, hesitant to start it, but it started, everything mm -hmm. was fine. Drove in for the meeting. We had the meeting to tell us what was actually gonna happen, what our mission was gonna be and so forth. And then uh, when I went, to my office, I had six soldiers waiting at my door because they were fearful that they were going to go downrange. Mm -hmm. So I had to talk to them then. 
Germany's a little bit different because a lot of them, uh, some of them didn't have their families with them. They were in the States, mm -hmm. and some of them did, so there was some, some concern. And how long were you in Germany? Two days short of three years. And uh, were you still a first lieutenant? I was a, a captain. You're now a captain. Yes, I was a captain uh, at Fort Carson. Mm -hmm. I got promoted when I came back from the reforger exercise. Okay. So tell us what happened after Germany. After Germany, I went for advanced schooling at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey at the chaplain school. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was there from July until December. And then from then on, I went to my next assignment. And your next assignment was? Next assignment was Fort Sill, Oklahoma, yeah. where I was assigned to a, a field artillery unit of MLRS multiple launch rocket systems. So we went from maintenance to field artillery. Yes. Uh, tell us what that was like. That was a learning process because every unit you go to, you have to learn what their mission is and mm -hmm. what they do. So it was quite an experience, and I. It's very technical. Mm -hmm. The weapon systems in a in a rocket launcher are very technical, and the kids who the soldiers who are really kids, 19, 20 years old, play video games, and so they have great expertise and agility to do that. And it was interesting for me because many times we would go to White Sands Missile Range to fire our our rockets, and you would see the rockets flying out in the distance. Mm -hmm and it was quite an experience. And when you counseled soldiers, was there, uh, is there any such thing as a typical uh, problem with an army soldier? Uh, no, no, uh, there's no um, specific situation that addresses every soldier. Every soldier comes to you with a different problem. Mm -hmm. Some of them are unique, some of them are eye-opening, mm -hmm. but there's, there's no manual that tells you specifically how to deal with certain situations. You learn as you go along. Mm -hmm. you, get, you get generalized training and counseling and, and you do different scenarios and training. Mm -hmm. And you always get trained for my entire military career, you always had training where you learn things as situations come up. Uh, in, in the society that affect the military, you get training to be able to help you counsel soldiers. Mm -hmm. But I counseled more soldiers in a month on active duty than I did in the whole 17 years of my ministry. Really? Now you are, um, you're also a priest in the Orthodox Church. Correct. Did you counsel mainly Orthodox or all no, types? you counsel everybody. You're, you're, mm -hmm. My responsibility as a priest was to serve the Orthodox personnel that were assigned to where I was at. Mm -hmm. So every Sunday I had services just like I would here in the parish. Mm -hmm. And then during the week I worked in the, in the battalion or brigade or wherever I was assigned uh, to counsel soldiers. Mm -hmm. So I did counsel, I did counsel Orthodox, mm -hmm. but I counseled many other soldiers. Okay. Let's backtrack a little bit. When you were stationed at Fort Sill, were you in the reserves now? No. I was on active You're duty. You're still active, okay. Correct. And did, were you ever put on reserves? When I left active duty mm -hmm. from that assignment at Fort Carson mm -hmm. uh, in 1997, I, I, I went back to, I went to the reserves. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to the National Guard, I went to the reserves. There were more opportunities. There was a unit mm -hmm. uh, in Londonderry, New Hampshire that needed a chaplain and the church here needed a priest. Mm -hmm. So it kind of worked out for me. And the church in question happens to be? Annunciation um, Orthodox Church, Albanian Archdiocese. Mm -hmm. And okay. I came here. Which and the military in a lot of ways, uh, I'm, a, I'm Slavic by ethnic background, mm -hmm. and I've served Russian churches in my entire ministry except when I went in the military. And there you have different ethnic Orthodox mm -hmm. who uh, are assigned. So I got a chance to see the customs of the other Orthodox because they were there. And in, during Christmas and Easter, their traditions we shared, and mm -hmm. it was a great experience. Okay. So now you're, uh, you, let's go back to Fort Sill. How yep. long were you there? I was there three and a half years. And I served uh, a battalion, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I became the brigade chaplain and the administrator of the Dinu Post Chapel. So I had additional responsibilities. Were you still a captain at that time? Yes. What happened after Fort Sill? Fort Sill, I, I decided to go back to the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom was by herself and my mother-in-law was by herself also. And my next assignment probably would have been back overseas and I just felt that it was not a good thing to do. So I decided to leave active duty and transfer into the reserves. And when was this? I came here in uh, July mm -hmm. of 97. And you mentioned Londonderry, New Hampshire. Correct. And what was the uh, unit again? It was a uh, combat engineer heavy unit. And they mm -hmm. basically would go in and build roads and buildings and uh, do all types of construction. And with this particular unit, it, did it stay in Londonderry? It was in Londonderry and then it, 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 did, it did mobilize, but after I left. Mm -hmm. And they've gone back. The first one of the, one of the companies went to, to Bosnia uh, to do uh, construction there. And then there was another company assigned, which were firefighters. They also went to Bosnia, but I didn't go. Mm -hmm. They went after I left. Okay. So you're still on reserves yep. uh, in Londonderry. Let's go advance a couple of years up to September 11, 2001. Tell, tell us what happened. Okay. Uh, let me backtrack a little okay. bit. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, while I was with the combat engineers, I got promoted to major. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when I got promoted to major in the reserves, you look for a position that's comparable in a unit. Mm -hmm. So that there was a position that opened up in the combat hospital and that was a major's position. So I transferred out of the combat engineers and into the hospital unit. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with the hospital unit for a period of time and then the hospital unit was going away. So it was time for me to move. So what was going to happen is I was going to move up to the Regional Readiness Command, the 94th Regional Readiness Command at Devons mm -hmm. and be the assistant uh, chaplain. In the meantime, 655 Area Support Group, a unit was mobilized and they didn't have a chaplain. And I had done all my schooling, praying that I would not have to stop my schooling before I got mobilized. Mm -hmm. And uh, God blessed me to do that. So I had finished my schooling and immediately after uh, was assigned to 655 and I deployed uh, with them to Fort Drum, New York. And the, the mission of the area support group was to prepare soldiers, National Guard and reservists, to go downrange, to go to Afghanistan or Iraq. So our mission there was to train them while, while they were there for a period of time and then prepare them uh, to go downrange. And my responsibility was similar to what I did in Germany. Uh, during the first Gulf War, except it was more detailed here because I was the, the uh, special s staff chaplain, special officer for the uh, installation chaplain at Fort Drum in mobilization. So every, every uh, day, once we got going, we trained soldiers to go long range. Mm -hmm. The final once they were trained and fit and ready to go, uh, then we would, we would take them out to a building on the airfield and uh, we would uh, send them off. Mm -hmm. And then we, we would receive them back when they returned. So every, every time a plane took off with soldiers on, I always wondered what that was like to go long range. <laughs> So I was mobilized in October of 2004. In January of 2005, the installation chaplain called me in his office to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, do you want the good news first or the bad news first? And I said, well, give me the, the bad news first. And he said, you're going down, you're going to Afghanistan. 
I said, what? He said, and the good news is you're only going to go for a month, a little over a month. So they explained to me that they needed an Orthodox priest in Afghanistan, and they didn't have anybody to send, and I was the only one on active duty who was ready to go. So the general at Fort Drum agreed that I would go, but only for, for a month. So I prepared to go. Mm -hmm. When we in process at Fort Drum, we only did certain things up to the point because we were, we were not going overseas. We were, we were in CONUS, they call it CONUS, in the continental United mm -hmm. States. When you mobilize, you go O CONUS, which means you go outside the country. So all the training I got stopped at my staying at Fort Drum. After I was going to be mobilized downrange, then that changed and I had to take the additional training, which was, you know, identifying certain things and uh, you had to take a um, compass course just in case you got lost and a number of other things. Mm -hmm. So I had to take all that. And I listened to all the briefings um, because we would brief the soldiers before they left, you know, don't drink the water, drink bottled water, uh, always wear clothing, always wear shoes, uh, you know, don't, don't scratch your eye if you have dirt on your hands, mm -hmm. things like that. And you never think medical. about it until you're mm -hmm. in that position. A little bit medical, a little bit cultural. Yes, yes. yes. So uh, when did you go to Afghanistan? I left, I believe, the end of January. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, flew, I flew commercial. So I flew from, mm -hmm. from uh, Fort Drum uh, to Washington, Dulles, not Washington, uh, BWI, Baltimore. And then from there, I flew to Germany, to Frankfurt, Germany. And then I board, boarded uh, Qatari Airlines and flew to Doha, Qatar which is where um, Norman Schwarzkopf mm -hmm. at the first Gulf War did all his briefings. He did it there. And I, the reason why I went there is because that's where you go and then from there you fly uh, into country. So I spent about maybe three or four days there because my equipment kind of changed in planes, got lost. But then once I got everything, I flew from Doha to um, uh, Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. And were you attached to any specific unit? I was attached to the task force that was there. I had special orders assigned to that task force to be used to uh, do orthodox services for personnel uh, throughout the theater. So tell us what Afghanistan was like. It was scary. Uh -huh. Scary in the sense of many things that, that um, I experienced there were things that I trained for but you never think they're going to happen. Mm -hmm. But they did happen. As an example, most of the time I flew. I flew in C-130 cargo planes because that was the most expeditious way to get around. And if you convoy, you had a convoy with more than one vehicle, usually three at a minimum. And one time I did convoy with one of the first sergeants. I went to, um, to Kabul. And... Um, I remember when we were leaving, we were leaving Bagram in, in the military, you're very careful when you load weapons. And the only time you load weapons is when you're on the range, you don't carry live ammunition. But I think it hit home when everybody got out of the vehicle and loaded their weapons with uh, real ammunition. That kind of made me a little bit nervous. Understandably. And as we drove, as we drove, my chaplain assistant was with me, and I asked him, I said, we're on these roads in the mountains where there are no trees, you're accessible, you're open, everything is open. And I said, what happens if somebody fires at our vehicle and disables the vehicle? So he explained to me what, what was going to happen, and, I, and he said to me, chaplain, don't worry, I'll protect you. So it was, a, it was a very emotional moment. Right. And did your assistant get through okay? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. We all did fine. We now, all did fine. As um, you weren't confined to any one area of Afghanistan, no. you, you got to see pretty much the whole country. My responsibility was to make sure that I visited all, most of the areas mm -hmm. uh, where there were Orthodox personnel. So I went to Kandahar. Uh, 
went to um, Kabul. Mm -hmm. I went to uh, two of the forward operating bases. I went to Uzbekistan because we had an outpost there. Mm -hmm. So I, I flew around quite a bit. And did you have the opportunity to counsel soldiers? Yes. Yes. I counseled soldiers mm -hmm. uh, while I was there, not only uh, Orthodox, but, but non Orthodox, and civilians. There were some, there were civilians there too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I helped the chaplains when I was in an area where I wasn't doing much as far as what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And then I also did that in Doha, Qatar too, because I was there for a while but before I redeployed back again. So I helped the, the chaplain who mm -hmm. I knew was there. Did you ever have uh, contact with the civilians in Afghanistan? Yes, th there were civilians who uh, worked on on um, Bagram, they were building things, and uh, then I had contact with civilians where, where I, wherever I went there were civilians. Mm -hmm. And then when we traveled by car, by convoy, you, you saw civilians in the town. Uh -huh. uh, did they treat you well? I really didn't, they were there, Yeah. but I took some pictures, I asked mm -hmm. permission to take pictures and they allowed me to take pictures of them, but I didn't really, there was mm -hmm. no everyday type conversation. You were in some of the hot spots in Afghanistan. Is there any uh, experience that stands out in your mind? Well, one time we were on the, on the road or a convoy and the convoy had a stop and they never tell you why, why you're stopping. And um, basically there was uh, explosives that were being exploded on the road and they, they held us from going, going beyond that point. Mm -hmm. So. Every time I flew, we flew mm -hmm. in, a, in a unique pattern, coming down and taking off. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite interesting. So you stayed in Afghanistan for a month? A little over a month, yes. And when did you get back to this country? I, at the end of February. End of February. I came back to Fort Drum and assumed my position in my role at Fort Drum with a better understanding of what soldiers faced when they deployed downrange, which mm -hmm. kind of helped me. Um, able to minister better. Mm -hmm. What happened after you got back? You're, you're back in Fort Drum. Yes. And how long were you in Fort Drum? I was there until May, May of 2006. Okay. So what, what happened was all the soldiers and all the units that we helped prepare to go downrange, we started bringing them back after they were there for a year. Mm -hmm. So all the units that went down, we in process them back again. And once that was done, um, our, our specific mission ended. And what happened was there were um, some of our troops in 655, we only had 40 people. Some of those uh, redeployed back home. But they asked me and a few others to stay on because of what I did. And at that time, 10th Mountain was getting ready to deploy. And I was basically the chaplain who did this, so I, I helped them deployed on range and then I stayed for a while mm -hmm. uh, to help families in situations or whatever but I I had a church here and I w really wanted to get back. Mm -hmm. At this time were you still a major? Actually when I got back from Afghanistan uh, I got promoted to lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. the, board, the board met for promotion and I had gotten back I was in my office sitting and the uh, deputy chaplain came in and con congratulated me, so. Well, pretty direct. Yeah. And what, uh, you were still at Fort Drum? And I stayed at Fort Drum. Mm -hmm. I helped the um, 10th Mountain move out mm -hmm. and I stayed for a little while and uh, another chaplain was replacing me and he came on board and I kind of handed off my duties with him and then I came back home mm -hmm. and um, when I came back home I, I was reassigned to the 94th Regional Readiness Command, the position I would have had before I deployed. Mm -hmm. And where was that based out of? In uh, Devons, in Air, Mass. Mm -hmm. And uh, Devons was still an active base at that time, no, wasn't it? No, no it, was, okay. it was basically reserves. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's uh, where you stayed until? I stayed there. Uh, until the 94th Regional Readiness Command went away. Mm -hmm. 
they were downsizing and that, that command was going away, was going to stand up someplace in the south as a brigade as opposed to a regional readiness command. Mm -hmm. So I stayed on uh, there until they um, went away. I would have retired before that, but mm -hmm. but um, the chief of chaplains was asking if anybody wanted to stay beyond their retirement date, their mandatory retirement date. I would have turned 60. I would have had to retire. Mm -hmm. So I applied if for some reason they needed me to go to Afghanistan again or if I could be of help. And um, they kept me on because of the Regional Readiness Command. So the Regional Readiness Command, I believe, went away in September, September of 2009. Mm -hmm and no I'm sorry 2008 mm -hmm. and so I stayed until until they um, until they left mm -hmm. and you did eventually retire well I transferred to a medical brigade that was there mm -hmm. and uh, supported the med medical brigade for about two months and then um, a general in a medical command in Staten Island was looking for a chaplain and he asked if I would come down to Staten Island and be his chaplain. I said, well, I'm going to retire. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's feasible to do. He said, just come down. So I spent my last eight months or so uh, in Staten Island at the medical brigade and then I retired from there. And this was in 2009? Correct. September 1st, 2009, I retired. As a lieutenant colonel? Yes with a whole bunch of medals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After you retired, did, uh, aside from your duties here at the Albanian Orthodox Church, did you join any, um, uh, sir, uh, like the VFW or any other uh, military organization? As soon as I got back from Afghanistan, I had a, a soldier in my unit who uh, belonged to a VFW. And so he immediately had the paperwork for me to sign mm -hmm. uh, to become a member. So I signed the paperwork and became a member. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been a member of the VFW since I came back in 2005. Mm -hmm. And so now uh, uh, I, I'm the VFW chaplain for the state of Massachusetts. They asked me to be their chaplain. So mm -hmm. the other chaplain was retiring. And what are the duties there like? attend meetings, talk to veterans, promote the veterans to join uh, in the area where you live or in contact with people. Mm -hmm. And as state chaplain for the VFW, uh, I know it, it's been a challenge for VFWs to uh, help maintain membership as older members die off. Uh, has, has you've, have you had that kind of challenge? Yes. Mm -hmm. But there are they're out there, and, and you just need to be pursuant and ex go out. It's it's kind of like the chaplain's responsibility in the unit. If you expect soldiers to come to you, they're not going to come to you. But if you go to them and build mm -hmm. a, up a rapport, uh, they're going to know who you are, and they won't hesitate. So it's kind of like the VFW. And there are there are many soldiers who really don't want to join any organizations, and I understand that. Okay. But we're, but we're veterans, we're soldiers, and that's a unique occupation. Not everybody can be in the military. Mm -hmm. So right now you are still the, uh, the main guy over at Albanian Orthodox yeah. Church, yeah. state chaplain for uh, the VFW, Correct. Massachusetts. Yeah. Any other positions? Not really. That's enough. <laughs> Keeps you busy. Yes. How important was you in serving the military? I... It was, a, it was a rewarding feeling because you were giving back something that you, you had received. And as I said, being a soldier, is, not everybody can be a soldier, and that's not bad. Mm -hmm. But I think you have an obligation and a responsibility uh, to serve your fellow soldiers in your country and to do it honorably. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I've tried to do that. As a chaplain, you have been in a unique position to try and help uh, these, these souls along as they're serving in the military. Uh, is there any other experience that stands out in your mind? Not really. Not really? I, I just, it, it's, it, um, there are many, but it's, it's hard to just to pinpoint really mm -hmm. one, one thing. I think that probably the greatest thing for me was 
um, going downrange to understand uh, what what it's like to be a soldier mm -hmm. in combat. And Afghanistan was different than Iraq. Iraq was uh, more violent, or Afghanistan at the time I was there was not too bad, but it was still um, quite a challenge. But to go to go downrange, I think that was probably mm -hmm. the most memorable experience that I. It, it changed my life in ways of, of thinking, family-wise, and uh, when I counseled soldiers that had family issues, I was even more understanding than I was before because I know what it's like to separate from your family and, and be in a place where you may or may not come back. And when I was at Fort Drum, usually what happened was as the soldiers left the building and walked to their plane, uh, there was always usually the commanding general and our commander and the sergeant major and maybe a few other people and me. And uh, I was the last person that they shook hands with when they got on the plane. And you often wonder, um, with the great numbers of soldiers that you deploy, some of them will not come home mm -hmm. alive. And that was always a concern. Every time I shook, shook a soldier's hand, I always wondered, prayed that that soldier would come back. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier in the interview about your son who joined the Marine Corps and yes. served for six years. Yep. Did he serve overseas? He, he was in from 1990 until 1997. Mm -hmm. And um, he, was in, um, he, was, he was in the Philippines before they, they uh, closed the base there. Mm -hmm. But most of his time was in, in uh, spent in California and embassy duty. He spent uh, three years on embassy duty. Mm -hmm. And did you ever discuss your experiences with him or his experiences with you? We've, we've talked, but not in great detail. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why. Most, most uh, it's hard to relate to a civilian person, even though my son wasn't civilian, but it's hard to relate to a civilian person what you do. even. Even clergy, I found when I went in the military, a lot of my clergy brethren didn't understand what what I did in the military, and it's hard to explain that to them because they, the concept isn't there until you've experienced it. Mm -hmm. Father Joe, is there anything else you would like to say um, for those who will be watching this in the future? I'd like to thank my wife Nancy mm -hmm. and my two children for for allowing me to be in the military because if it wasn't for them I wouldn't be in the military because it's a family thing and they were they were the ones that really uh, supported me uh, to be a military chaplain and I do thank them for that mm -hmm. and my church here in Natick when I was mobilized they said for however long you're gone you're gone but we're always going to be here for you to come back to so I do appreciate that and a lot of the clergy who served in my absence uh, to keep the normal operations of the church going. Mm -hmm. and, and you for allowing me, as I said at the beginning, uh, to be able to do this and hopefully maybe some men and, or women will look at this and uh, in the future they, they will join the military to serve, whether it's chaplains or some other type of specialty. Uh, it's a great rewarding experience. You learn a lot, you grow, you grow and uh, you, you have a better understanding of what this country stands for. All right, well, Father Joe Golick, I thank you so much for coming in and taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you very much again. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Thank you.